As someone who never wanted to get married, but just got married and ended up planning that whole wedding in under two weeks, I knew pretty much nothing about wedding rings, but I learned fast. And I learned that there's a lot more than I thought there was to consider when you're choosing a wedding ring. So in this video, I'm gonna share what those things are. I'll go through materials, styles, the number of rings, a lot of people get more than one, the fit and feel of the ring, the budget, and I'll also provide some general ring shopping tips that you may not have thought of and I'll share tips for how to make the stone in your ring appear larger so you end up getting more bang for your buck. <laughs> Hi guys, Autumn Beckman here. Welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel. My channel is all about luxury living on a budget and in this video we will talk about wedding rings. All the basics you need to know and how to get the most for your dollar. Now though I didn't know much of anything about wedding rings in particular, I have gained some knowledge on jewelry and I would say I probably have higher knowledge of jewelry than the average person and that is all due to a friend of mine who's also a YouTuber. Her name is Jill Maurer. I will link her channel below and she has a plethora of videos that teach you all kinds of things, very, very helpful things about jewelry. And that's where I gained about 99% of my jewelry knowledge. So I did at least come into this process with some of that and knowing some of the right questions to ask. In fact, Jill was one of the first people who knew we got married because she was one of the first phone calls we made to ask her about rings. Let's start with materials. Since the wedding ring is something that most people expect to wear every Every day for the rest of their life, it needs to be durable. And that durability has a lot to do with the materials that you select. It also primarily has to do with the hardness of those materials. Let's talk metals first. Sterling silver is a soft metal. That's not something you would want to get in a wedding ring because it will get damaged over time with scratches and dents. Sterling silver also oxidizes so you'd be polishing it all the time. This is why we see high-end jewelry made in gold and platinum and rhodium and titanium. These are more durable metals. Platinum, however, is actually softer than gold. Once I learned this, I opted to go with gold instead of platinum. And gold comes in yellow gold or white gold or rose gold, even black gold, which is more typical in men's rings. So you have a lot of options there. Now let's talk stones. When selecting a stone for your wedding ring, you should be aware of the Mohs scale. This is a hardness scale of gemstones. The Mohs scale goes from zero to 10, with 10 being the hardest stones. These are gonna be the stones that are less likely to break, chip, or scratch. In my research, I learned that dust, just the common dust that floats around everywhere, is a 7.5 on the Mohs scale. So it's a good idea to get a stone that's above a 7.5, because when you're cleaning your ring, if there's dust on it, the dust could scratch any stones that are also 7.5 or below. Now personally I wanted a white stone or a clear stone so the most typical stones in those range and those colors would be white topaz, white sapphire, and of course diamonds. Notice on the scale that diamond is way up at the top at the high end of the scale and that's because it is that much harder than the stones below it. So the hardness increments on the Mohs scale are not even. They don't go in a straight line. Diamonds are way above everything else much harder than everything else. And that is exactly the reason that they are the most common stone in wedding rings, because they're the most durable. Now I mentioned sapphire and topaz in white or clear. They also come in other colors. A ruby is another stone higher than dust on the Mohs scale that you could consider. When you're considering metal, keep in mind some of the vocabulary that you will come across, such as solid gold or gold plated or gold vermeil. The highest quality of those is going to be your solid gold. That means if you cut the ring in half, it will be gold throughout, whereas plated and vermeil will have a different metal on the inside. Now let's talk ring style. I had no idea what I wanted. I just knew that I didn't want what I think of in my head as the stereotypical engagement or wedding ring, which is a relatively thin band with one solitaire diamond sticking out. Maybe that is what you want. If it is, there are lots of options, but either way, you might first want to figure out whether you want a ring with stones or a band without stones. If you want stones, 
stones, what shape will they be? What size will they be? As you're shopping in person for stones, you can start getting familiar with carat weight, the carats of individual stones, or the total carat weight, which tells you if you have multiple stones, the weight of all of them put together. You can start to figure out how many stones you might want, what kinds of settings, there are infinite kinds of settings, the height of your setting. So if you have your fingers like this, how high up do the stones go off your hand? That was something that was important to me because we're planning to move to a northern climate where I'll be wearing gloves a lot more. So I wanted a ring that wouldn't get in the way and hopefully won't get caught on gloves when I'm taking them on and off. So definitely consider your lifestyle and what you do with your hands when you're thinking about your ring. In addition to the stones and the setting of the stones, there are also so many different kinds of bands. They come in different widths, like really thin bands or thicker bands, but they also come in different thicknesses. And the best way I can describe that is when you close your fingers together like this, how much you're gonna feel that band against your other fingers. Will it be a narrow band where you don't really feel it? Or will it be a thicker band where it pokes on your other fingers and you can't even close your hand all the way? Some bands have stones all the way around them or part the way around them. Others have no stones at all. Also, most people don't think to think about this. Think about the inside of the band. Is it flat? Is it concave? Is it convex? If the inside of your ring is convex, that's what's called a comfort fit ring. Those rings tend to be more comfortable to wear. If you're looking for a thicker band, one that's taller, then a comfort ring might be very important to you because the taller rings tend to fit a little tighter. Let's say I wear a seven. If I have a thin band, I may be able to size down, but if I have a thicker band, I may need to size up to be able to get it on. Whereas a comfort fit set setting may allow me to have the same ring size with a thicker band. Also think about the edges of the ring, the top and bottom as it sits on your finger, the silhouette. Do you want a thin band with one giant stone? Do you want a band that's parallel on top and bottom and runs straight across? Do you want a band with more of an organic shape around the top and bottom? There are lots of options. And of course, what do you want the overall look or feel of your ring to be? Often it's a reflection of who you are. So do you want a shape that's more classic, something more modern? I came across several that looked more Victorian or more art deco. I saw rings that were inspired by nature or had very organic shapes or very structured shapes. Geometric. Do you want it to be symmetrical or asymmetrical? And also think about the meaning behind your ring. Do you want a design that has some kind of significance to you? Do you want to incorporate stones, for example, that have been in other pieces of jewelry that have been in your family or metals that have been in jewelry that's been in the family? or has some kind of significance to you. Or maybe you want a certain number of stones to represent something. One stone to represent you as a couple, or two stones to represent the two of you. Three stones often represents your past, present, and future together. Or maybe you have kids or animals and you want a stone for each member of the family. Maybe certain colors have significance for you and you want to incorporate those colors into the ring. Also think about how many rings you want. And if you want more than one, how are they going to work together? How will you be wearing them? A lot of people will get an engagement ring at the engagement and then a wedding band at the ceremony. At least in America, that's a traditional way that it's done. If you go that route and you want to wear both rings on one finger, you'll have to think about how your wedding band and your engagement ring will fit together. A lot of rings are sold in sets that way, so they automatically fit together. But if you don't go that route, then you'll have to consider it when you're buying them separately. Another thing to do is wear your engagement ring until the ceremony day, then switch that ring to your right hand and wear the wedding band on your left. But the most important thing to keep in mind is that you don't have to follow any of these traditions. Do whatever you want to do. I have one wedding ring, which is currently being sized. The ring I have on is what I consider my engagement ring. But really, I bought this ring for myself at Macy's for $25. It's cubic zirconia, some kind of metal plated in sterling silver. It's a beautiful ring. I love it. I get lots of compliments on it. It is not the high quality in terms of durability of materials that my wedding ring is. But it was important to me to have a ring during the engagement, even though it was a very short engagement, so I made that happen for myself. Due to our situation, I did not expect my now husband to go out and buy an expensive engagement ring for me and also buy an expensive wedding ring. So I'm perfectly happy with my $25 engagement ring, especially since I ended up with a wedding ring that I love. Let's go back to fit and feel for a second. I talked about that a little with the comfort ring. You'll also need to keep these things in mind. The size of your finger changes. It changes throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month, throughout the seasons, throughout the years. I would highly recommend that whatever ring you decide
slide on, it be a ring that can be sized. What that means is at some point on the ring, it is all metal with no stones. Now, I don't know for sure that a ring that has stones all around it can't be sized, but I know it would be a lot more difficult. Also keep in mind the weight of your ring. Some are going to be heavier than others because of the materials and the stones. When you try it on, don't just look at it like this and hold it up like this. Also put it down to your side. Your circulation changes a little bit in your hand then. Walk around the store with it like you would walk around normally, see how it feels. I have a ring that I put on once that felt great like this. And when I put my hand down, the weight of the ring tilted down and it started pinching my finger and it wasn't comfortable at all and I'm glad I didn't get that ring and I wouldn't have known it if I hadn't put my hand down. Also wiggle your hand a little, move it around, move your fingers. When you're trying rings on, see how the ring might shift and rotate on your hand. It's going to be very annoying if you pick a ring that you wear every day for the rest of your life and you're constantly having to adjust it back to center. Now let's talk price. I had no idea what to expect when I started looking at the prices of rings. My now husband did give me a budget that was the maximum he would like to spend. I will say that as rings go, I was surprised at how low that budget was. And I don't say that to throw any shade at him. He just tends to think things are a lot less expensive than they really are. So I did learn a few tips to help stretch your budget a little bit. Not spending more, but getting more for your money. Of course, it all depends on what you're looking for. First of all, let me say two things. The prices of rings and diamonds are all over the place. I looked at rings online. I looked at private jewelers. I looked at nationwide jewelry chains. I saw no rhyme or reason that this ring that I thought wouldn't be that expensive was so expensive, or this ring that I thought would be really expensive wasn't as much as I thought. So my first piece of advice is this to do what I did. If you don't know what kind of ring you want, just look at the rings, figure out what you want, and don't pay attention to the prices too much. Go look at rings in person, try on anything that catches your eye. You'll find that you learn a lot just by trying the rings on. When you pull them out, you can check the price if it's on there. You can ask what the price is. You may be surprised that some are a lot cheaper than you thought, and you're gonna have your mind blown a few times at how expensive some of the rings you try on are. But what you're trying to do at this point is figure out what kind of ring you want. Once you figure that out, then you'll probably be able to find something in your budget. Here are a few ways that you can get your ring a little less expensive. Sometimes a a lot less expensive. One, you can step down on the clarity and or the color of the stones. And we're talking particularly with diamonds here. You can actually save a lot of money just by getting a stone that's not quite as clear or that has a little bit of color in it. And a lot of those times, those are still very high quality stones and you don't see those differences with your naked eye. Another option is to consider lab grown diamonds rather than mined diamonds. I am aware that there are some people in the world who think that lab-grown diamonds are fake diamonds, but that is factually incorrect. Lab-grown diamonds are diamonds, just like mined diamonds are diamonds. The only difference is that they are created in different ways. Mined diamonds are created deep in the earth, and that means to get to them, for the most part, we have to mine, we have to dig, we have to destroy pieces of the earth to find those diamonds. Lab-grown are grown in labs. I'm sure that has its own environmental issues too. It uses electricity, who knows what else. But but they're going to be generally less expensive than the mined diamonds. So that's one way you can save money. Also, of course, you can consider stones that are not diamonds. If you want a clear stone, as I mentioned, the white sapphires, the white topaz, those will take your cost way down. Now, I did find when I was looking for rings with those stones that they were a lot more difficult to find when I went to jewelry stores. Diamonds are what they tend to have the most of, so your search may be more difficult there, but it is still something to consider. Also, once you're narrowing the rings down and you have a few that you're seriously considering, before you say you'll take it, ask what they can do on the price. Now I know a lot of us in America are not used to this. We see a sticker price, we think that is the price, and we pay that price. And in most instances there's no negotiation. But in jewelry that can be a different story. Now I don't know so much about national chains, but if you go to your local jeweler, your mom and pop shop, they can probably work with you on the price. And I was told by a jeweler to do this, and I've done it at several jewelry shops. They don't treat you any differently. They don't look down on you. They don't think you're trying to be cheap. In fact, they're like, 
let me check. And they go and they already have calculations and percentages based on the ring that they just figure out because they're prepared to lower the price for you. Be sure you ask. Now besides that, I have five tips for when you're shopping for your ring that you may not have thought to do on your own. One, shop around. I know that there are some people who have a particular jeweler in mind. Maybe they've always dreamed of a Tiffany ring, for example. But often in those cases, you are going to pay a premium. If you can afford that, that's great go that route. If you can't and you need to worry about your budget, shop around. Look at lots of different places. Look at physical retail stores. Look at shops online. There are so many options out there. It can be overwhelming, which is part of the reason I'm doing this video to help you narrow it down. But also keep in mind that different places will have similar rings for very different price points. So that's another reason you want to look in lots of places. Tip number two, try the rings on. Now that may seem very obvious, but what I found and was surprised by when I was trying rings on is I would see a ring in the case and I would think it was so beautiful and then I'd put it on and I didn't like it. There'd be something about it that I didn't like. It could be the fit or the feel, but generally it was the look. I liked it in the case, I didn't like it on my finger. I was surprised by that. Also, if I was looking online and then I was able to go into a shop and try a ring on, it looked different on my finger. Tip number three, when you do try rings on, and especially the ones that you really like and would like to come back to and look at again, don't just take photos of them on your phone, take video. That's much more important. Every jeweler I went to was okay with me doing that. And the reason you want video is so you can turn your hand to see the sparkle of the the ring, but also how it looks on your finger at different angles. And you want to not only do this, but turn your hand backwards so you can see what the other side of the band looks like, get it from different angles, and shoot it where you can see how high the ring is off your finger. You just want to shoot as many angles as you can so that you can go back on your phone and watch videos back to back to compare and see what you like best. Once you're ready to buy your ring, if your jeweler offers it, get the extended warranty. This is not something I would usually recommend. I think we all know usually you don't buy those things. This is a great time to do so. I ended up getting my ring from a national jeweler. The extended warranty that we were offered that was I think another $200 or so, it wasn't that much, was a lifetime warranty on the ring. They'll resize it for you a few times. They clean it. They'll reset stones. They tighten prongs. Oh, that's another tip is the prongs. If you have prongs that stick up off of your ring very much and you can tell by rubbing your finger over it to see how rough it feels, those are going to get caught on things. So be aware of that. If they get caught on something, you can pull the prong aside and your stone could fall out. So that's something you really want to keep in mind when you're choosing your ring. And tip number five when shopping for rings, I found this very helpful, go to places that have cheap cubic zirconia or plastic, whatever they are, rings in lots of different styles. You can try them on there and when you find some styles that are really what you're looking for, you can buy them cheap, like $25. You can buy several of them and wear them each for a few days or a few weeks and see what you think and figure out maybe the style that I thought I really liked doesn't work. Or maybe this one I like more than I thought I did. That can be very helpful for making this lifelong decision. Oh, and also a tip number six, look in the clearance section. A lot of jewelry stores will have a clearance section and you can find some fabulous bargains or shop during sales different times of the year. Now three tips to make your stones look bigger. This is where you can get more bang for your buck. The first one is to use multiple stones to create the illusion of a larger stone. I saw lots of rings like this when I was shopping. Let's say I have the center stone here. I saw rings that would have a big center stone, but when you looked closer, it was actually made up of maybe nine stones, smaller stones. And from a distance, they looked like a big stone. That's going to cut down on your cost a lot because the bigger your one stone is, the more expensive it is, of course. So if you have just a bunch of smaller stones, it can be a lot cheaper. Also keep in mind, the smaller stones you have are going to collect dirt and dust around them over time, so that may need to be cleaned more often. And as they collect that dirt and dust, it'll become more obvious that they're multiple stones. Tip number two, a halo setting. You have a center stone and then you have tiny stones around it. It's called the halo. And again, from a distance, that makes the stones look bigger. And the third tip is to be mindful of the cut of the stone. I learned something that I thought was very interesting. I'd never thought about this before. I'd never 
never heard this before. Let's say you have two stones and each of those two stones are one carat, but those stones are different cuts and one looks a lot bigger than the other. The reason for that is that some cuts of stone will have a larger surface area. So most of the stone is on the top and you know how a stone can be cut and like, let's say it's a round cut. So you have the big circle on the top and then it comes together at a point on the bottom. So there are some cuts where that surface is larger than other cuts and some cuts where the stone under the surface is larger or smaller. So what you wanna do if you want a stone that looks larger is go with certain cuts, the ones that have the larger surface area. The top four are marquee, pear, emerald, and oval, with oval being, from what I've read, the largest surface area. So let's say you have a one carat oval cut next to a one carat round cut. The oval is going to look bigger on the surface than the round cut. Now, like I said, my ring is out being Sized, but I'll pop in a video here of it and I'll go through with you quickly the decisions that I made that led me to this ring. One, I decided I wanted diamonds, so these are diamonds. Two, I wanted white gold. Oh, this is another tip for making your ring look bigger. Set it in white gold or some kind of a white metal because a yellow gold or a rose gold will cause contrast with diamonds. Whereas a white gold setting, the diamonds and the gold will blend together more and it gives the illusion of a larger stone. I chose a ring with a pretty low setting and height because of the gloves that I'm gonna be wearing when we're up in a more wintry environment. One of the things that I noticed I was very drawn to when I was trying rings on is that I wanted the edges of the ring, like the silhouette, to not be straight across and parallel. I wanted them to have some movement, some waves or something up and down. I knew I did not want a band that had stones that would touch my other fingers because I've had rings like that before and I find it uncomfortable. But I did want enough stones that it went pretty much finger to finger. I didn't want a center stone that stood up too much from my hand, but I did want a center stone that was raised a little bit from the others and that was a little larger than the others so that I would get the edge I was looking for. So basically I wanted it to be bigger in the center and then taper down. And if you're looking at it from here height wise, I wanted it to be taller in the center and taper down, but not too tall. I started out looking at very structured shapes. I thought I wanted an emerald cut ring. I still love emerald cut rings. This ring is emerald cut, but I ended up with a more organic shape that I'm just as happy with. My ring has five oval shaped diamonds and that has a significance to me because there are five of us. There's me, there's Paul, we have the two dogs, and we have my bird. That's five. Originally I'd intended to go toward lab grown diamonds and I looked at quite a few rings that were lab grown but you love what you love and the ring that I ended up with happens to be mined diamonds. Each of those five stones also has a halo of smaller diamonds around it and I really wanted to get my ring from a mom and pop shop, support a local business, but again, you love what you love. We were very constricted by time here. I went through this whole process in less than a week. I was getting very frustrated that I wasn't finding exactly what I wanted and especially something that would be in stock and in the right price range before the wedding because I really wanted to have the ring for the ceremony. And we had been going around to different mom and pop shops and I'd been looking online. And a few days before the ceremony, we decided to go to a mall because a mall has many jewelry stores and even though they tend to be changed stores, which is not where I wanted to get a ring, just personal preference. At least I'd be able to see a lot of rings, try a lot of things on, and get a better idea of what I wanted. And it turned out I found my ring at one of those stores, and it just happened to be in the clearance case, and it was about 60% off. So this ring that I love, that is the perfect ring for me, also came in as is my style, under budget, at the shockingly low price of just under a thousand dollars for what I think is a spectacular ring that has everything I was looking for and that of course holds so much meaning now. Now I know that was a lot of information. I hope this helps. I'm gonna take my notes for this video and put them down in the description box below in a Google Doc link so you can open that and reference it on your journey to finding your ring. And I hope that helps as well. Oh, and if you're looking for a wedding ring or an engagement ring, congratulations. Very best wishes to you. And I hope to see you back here next time. Bye.